Good evening, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to uh, a Majors in Quinn virtual author event. We are so pleased to welcome you to the first virtual event of our 2021 uh, author event schedule. Um, and my name is Annie. I'm the events coordinator at Majors and Quinn, which if you are not familiar, is an independent bookstore in Minneapolis, Minnesota, located in Uptown. We are open to the brow to, to browsing to the public uh, in limited capacity, so you can stop by the store and see us. We are also available all the time online at uh, www.majorsandqueen.com. Um, so thank you once again for supporting an independent bookstore by registering for this virtual event. We are very pleased to have you watching on our YouTube channel. And this event uh, did require registration. And if you registered, you received a $5 gift card to our website. That should have appeared in your inbox today. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to events at majorsandquinn.com if you don't see that there. We encourage you to use it towards uh, a book related to today's event. We're very pleased to have the virtual launch of Rachel Swearingen's collection of short stories, How to Walk on Water, and you can get that on our website. Um, we are also pleased to have as her conversation partner, her interviewer, Angela Ajayi, um, who uh, has a short story in a collection, Behan America Best Debut Short Stories 2017. And there is also a link to that on uh, the events page of our website if you're interested in that collection as well. However, the gift card can be used for anything on our site. We are Again, very thankful for your support of our independent bookstore this year in 2021. So tonight we're going to have a conversation between these two authors. Uh, Rachel's going to read a little bit from her collection, and they're just going to talk about uh, the craft of writing and sh short fiction in specific. Um, and then we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions for either of the writers, please drop them in the chat, the chat box that you see uh, next to the live video. We can see them here and we will get to those at the end. Um, and thank you so much. Also, one lucky viewer from this event will receive a copy of Rachel's book, How to Walk on Water. Um, Rachel has kindly purchased a copy of the book from Makers and Quinn and we'll be sending it to a, a lucky viewer. So we will be randomly selecting a name from the registered folks later tonight and you'll get an email if you are the winner. So thank you once again. And now please allow me to introduce our wonderful speakers tonight. Rachel Swearingen, uh, over, over here <laughs> with the bookcase behind her. Uh, Rachel Swearingen's story, stories and essays have appeared in Vice, Missouri Review, Ken Review, Off Assignment, Agni, American Short Fiction, and others. Her debut story collection, How to Walk on Water, won the 2018 New American Fiction Prize. She's the recipient of the 2015 Missouri Review Jeffrey E. Smith Editor's Prize in Fiction a 2012 Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award, and the 2011 Mississippi Review Prize in Fiction. In 2019, she was named one of 30 writers to watch by the Guild Literary Complex. She holds a BA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a PhD from Western Michigan University. She currently teaches at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. And as her interviewer today, we are very pleased to have Angela Ajayi, whose first story, Galena, published in the Fifth Wednesday Journal, won the 2017 Penn Robert J. Dow Short Story Prize for Emerging Writers. Her essays, book reviews, and author interviews have appeared in The Common Online, Wild River Review, and the Minneapolis Star Tribune, where she is a contributing book critic. She holds a BA in English Literature from Calvin College and an MA in Comparative Literature from Columbia University. And she is working on her first collection of stories. Thank you both so much for being here. Can't wait to hear your conversation. And I will be back at the end to uh, take everyone's question. Bye. So Rachel, I think I'm supposed to say something here. Right? <laughs> well, thank you, Annie. And uh, thank you, the bookstore. It's, um, it's actually great to focus on something other than politics right now. Um, and um, I'm trying to think that when I met Rachel, it was probably the winter of 2015. 
and we met at a coffee shop and uh, it was probably one of those cold winters and Rachel turned to me and asked if I was a writer and um, we just had a great conversation about writing and I think in many ways this evening is an extension of that. Um, we've been talking about short fiction for a long time and uh, you're more seasoned than I am so I learned from you and well <laughs> I hope you learned from me and um, so I yeah I, I so I, I want to just have maybe just say a, a few words about the collection um, congratulations on getting it published um, all that hard work I think uh, has turned into a stunning collection of short stories and um, here's a short quote from a review that I quite liked and um, Maybe after that you could you could read from from the collection, and here's this, the quote. It's very short. It's from Forward Reviews, and it says, "In the shocking and appealing stories of How to Walk on Water, characters meet every ill-advised what if with one upmanship, resulting in dangers and delight." So, well, Rachel. <laughs> um, Let's hear some of those dangers and delights. <laughs> All right. Uh, and it's so funny because Angela, you know, you and I, we've talked so much about danger in fiction and how to use that. I just, um, I'm, I have to just say, I'm so happy to be here with you. And um, I'm just so grateful to have your friendship. And it's, it's such a cool thing to be able to do an event with someone that you really care about. So um, thank you. And um, I'm really excited for when your book comes out because I just love your work and I know it's only a matter of time and uh, I've, I've gotten some peeks at your collection. So watch out world, <laughs> it's coming to you. Um, cool. I'm going to read from Advice for the Haunted and it was 2014 too, by the way. So it's been oh, okay. years now the wrong date. and it was the winter was, was it was 20 below, um, I had just moved back and it was 20 below for like two weeks or, or, or colder. And so I remember I was, by the time I reached out to you, I was desperate to know someone that I could talk to. So that day when I, I uh, asked you in the coffee shop, if you were a writer, my heart was pounding a little bit. I was oh. working. And, um, and so uh, what, a, what a great little bit of kismet that was. Um, so anyway, um, I'll read just the opening of the last story um, in the collection, and it's called Advice for the Haunted. And um, I was thinking about this story today. Actually, Angela is one of the people that I had read it in an early version, I think. So um, thank you. Um, and I'll just tell you that there's uh, a couple here, a young, very young couple that has just bought an old condo apartment and they're um, they're uh, fixing it up, it's in Chicago. Any other couple would have thrown away the former owner's things and moved in. But two months after buying the apartment at auction, Nick and I were still using it as a playhouse. The former owner's name had been Natalia. We had inherited all of her possessions, her pantry and freezer stuffed with food. Under the couch, she had wedged bottles of cheap red wine. Nick joked that we could survive at Natalia's forever. It's like our own private fallout shelter, he said, as we peeled back her bedspread and crawled under the sheets. We didn't concern ourselves with the circumstances of her death. We were young and in love, and the misfortunes of others had nothing to do with us. The flat had one bedroom, an office, and a narrow kitchen that opened into a long central room. Heavy drapes shut out the city view. The furniture was outdated, the Persian rugs threadbare and stained. The ceilings and walls had recently been spackled, leaving bone white spots. On the buffet next to the dining table were stacks of postcards of paintings, many of them torn or chewed at the corners. We found a half-used bottle of anti-anxiety pills in the medicine cabinet, a glass accordion in a folded tablecloth, a baggie of foreign coins in a boot at the back of a closet. In a rickety piano bench, we discovered faded Polaroids of two girls at what looked like a family picnic. We were still paying rent for our own apartments and rarely talked of the future. 
At Natalia's, we'd spend entire weekends pretending we were the last two people on earth. We liked to camp it up. Zombies, I'd say. Meteorite, he'd say. He'd tear off his tie. It's at least three miles wide. Sunlight would be breaking through the drapes. Do you see how dark it's getting, he'd say. What will we ever do, I'd say, unbuttoning my blouse. We ransacked her cupboards, pulled out soapstone animals from Africa. We placed the rhinoceros and giraffe in compromising positions. We played like children, pillaging our closets. Then we learned from the downstairs neighbor that Natalia had been a recluse who hadn't left the apartment in years. Something had happened to the sister who bought, brought her supplies and Natalia had started venturing into the hallway. One day she left the building with a suitcase and somehow plunged to her death from the L platform just two blocks away. We continued to rearrange her furniture and Chatsky's. We still pretended we were secret agents or a strange new semi-human species that had survived the apocalypse. Entire weekends passed before we left the apartment or ate a real dinner, but we studied her photographs more closely now. We invented roles for Natalia in our games, captor, hostage, aunt. Once or twice a week, Nick and I met at Natalia's during my lunch break. We were soaking in Natalia's tub and Nick handed me a mug of wine. Don't look at me like that, he said. You know you're not going back to work. We thought it was a shame Natalia had had to bathe alone in such a wondrous tub. The guy beneath us had said that the morning of her death, she had said hello to him in the hallway. But she was all strange and spacey, really happy, you know, the kind of happy people get before they jump. But the suitcase, I said to Nick. He said she was carrying a suitcase. Why would she if she were planning on ending it all? He pulled a long leg out of the water and slung it over the edge of the tub. She should have never left, he said. She had everything she needed right here. I stood and reached for a towel. I'd been hearing noises, and what I heard then was the sound of a wrench knocking against metal inside the bathroom walls. The door creaked open and cold air rushed in. I hopped out of the tub and shut it, but as soon as I turned around, it opened again. Nick crossed his arms over his chest and in a rich falsetto said, Natalia, stay out, we're naked. I laughed out loud, but then came a sound like steel marbles rolling across the ceiling. I think even Nick had the feeling we weren't alone. He handed me his mug. Hold this, he said. And when I reached, I slipped on the tile and struck my head. Nick got out and examined my forehead. It's not that bad, he said, barely a scratch, but you're going to have a goose egg. Natalia did it, I said. I was only half kidding. We tightened our towels and made our way to the kitchen. I took a box of crackers and a jar of peanut butter from the cupboard. I don't know what it is about this place that makes me so hungry, I said. Nick dug into the peanut butter with a spoon. It's that we didn't buy this food ourselves. No, it's like it's not real, like there's no world out there, I said. Precisely, he said. He pulled me close. Let's never leave. We joked about turning the apartment into a private country, a micronation like Christiania in Denmark. We'd call it the Republic of Natalia and design our own special stamp. The next morning, I noticed an imprint in the bedding as if someone had been sitting there watching us. Nick was in the kitchen paging through one of Natalia's books and he showed it to me. Classical mathematics, he said. No wonder she didn't have any friends, I said. I thought you liked math, he said. He filled one of the miniature cups from her china set with coffee and put it down in front of the extra stool at the breakfast bar. Good morning, Nat, he said. How'd you sleep? She's grumpy in the morning, he said to me. Doesn't like to talk, he winked. I think it's time to tell Oscar and Joelle, I said, about the apartment, I mean. Oscar and Joelle were our closest friends. They were the reason we were together. And Oscar believed in ghosts. He was a sort of amateur ghost hunter. I wanted to get his read on the place. Let's have them over for dinner or something, I said. You know how Natalia feels about company, Nick said. Besides, they don't have visas yet. I'm going to be late, I said. Nick put the book aside and got up to make another pot of coffee. We don't start before 10 in the Republic of Natalia, he said. Too bad I don't work for the Republic, I said. If I keep this up, we won't be able to afford to live in the Republic anymore. I had intended the words more lightly. I never asked you to put up the down payment, he said. It didn't need to be that large. So far, we had managed to mostly avoid talking about the purchase or my paying more toward the mortgage. I was in the middle of several large acquisitions at work and any conversation about interest rates and balloon payments was likely to turn into an argument 
about corporate greed in the face of famine and war. I left Nick in the kitchen and went to Natalia's closet to look for something to wear. We almost never stayed overnight during the week. I was traveling more for due diligence, always to other cities in the Midwest or the South. I was constantly shuttling between airports and hotels, between my own apartment, Natalia's, and my office downtown. I felt disoriented and my excuses for leaving work were growing absurd. Most of Natalia's clothes were outdated. I recognized a purple dress from a photograph of a much younger Natalia in front of a fountain with a boyfriend somewhere in Europe. We had propped the photo against the lamp of, of her dresser and I looked at it again and I, as I changed into the dress. The boyfriend had a goofy grin and thick hair that stuck up in a cowlick and Natalia threw her head back to laugh. She must have been healthy then. I searched her underwear drawer with dread, wishing I had brought an overnight bag. All of Natalia's undergarments were plain white cotton, many with frayed elastic. I reminded myself that Natalia was dead and wouldn't care if I wore something of hers, but I rejoiced when I found a lacy pair of silk panties that still had a price tag. I wondered when she had bought them and why just one pair. I put them on and for a minute I was Natalia, untouched for too long. At Fullerton, I waited on the platform for the red line. I checked my email on my phone, only partially aware of a pack of unruly school kids horsing around. One of them slammed into me. I stumbled toward the tracks and an enormous woman grabbed me and pulled me back. I thought little of this until I was standing in the compartment and the woman pointed at my phone and said, that thing's gonna be the death of you. I squirmed against the sensation of the silk against my skin. I'm wearing the underwear of a dead lady, I wanted to confess. I arrived at work late for yet another meeting and made up an excuse about a mechanical problem delaying my train. It was a harmless lie, but I had told so many by then, I had the uneasy feeling that I would be fired. After work that evening, I went out to meet my running club. They were a rugged group that ran even when temperatures dipped below zero. I wanted to be like them. At the waterfront, I tried to keep up. Lake Michigan frothed and gulls struggled against the wind. The man in front of me lagged too. He kept wiping his arm across his brow. He tripped and regained his balance and then his legs buckled under him. At first I thought he had simply slipped but he wasn't moving and several other runners gathered around him. I don't think he's breathing, a woman said. I stood looking on with the crowd and then sirens sounded and before long a paramedic was pushing us back saying, give us some room folks. The others turned back, but I jogged another mile or two. I didn't know the man, and that's what I told myself all along the lake. He's just a stranger. You don't know him. This sort of thing happens every day. I didn't want to be alone, so I called Nick and went to Natalia's. I pulled off my wet clothes and filled the bath. The refraction of my hands underwater made them appear broken off and reattached at the wrong angle. I ran my fingers over the welt on my forehead. I had fallen or almost fallen twice in less than 24 hours, and then directly in front of me, a man had collapsed and probably died. I got into bed, but not before putting the soapstone animals away in Natalia's dresser, not before turning on the bedside light and making sure my phone was within reach. I couldn't stop seeing the man at the lake, his legs giving way. I turned my face to the pillow and tried not to think of Natalia drooling into the same feathers. Then Nick was standing in the bedroom doorway. He held his arms out and made his eyes dull. And I said, yes, please bring on the zombies. And I'll just stop the story there. Thank you, Rachel. That was uh, it's an interest, it's such an interesting story. I, I, whenever I think about it, I always think about um, how that story came to be. Um, you know, it takes these, it takes this imaginative leaps, right? And um, it, it seems to come from this really uncanny place and it has this uncanny feel to it. So I mean, since we're talking about writing short fiction, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about where that story originated. I mean, in your mind and, and, and how it all came to sort of be on the page. Yeah, so I think that story as well is just um, quite a few of my stories. I don't tend to write from from memory in the in the way that I think memory triggers a lot of your work. Um, but 
but personal experience does come in in some ways kind of sidelong and when um i grew up with a father who did a lot of um he, he went to estate sales and he was a, an antique collector and um, seller and so we were often you know there were things coming through the house that belonged to other people and it wasn't until i started getting older that i started thinking about this you know and you start losing people and um, I think that I wanted to write a story. When the story started, I wanted to write a story where someone is interacting with these old things and in a way that I might've done when I was younger, when I wasn't thinking as much about how those things came into my possession. And, um, and so that's kind of, that was the trigger. And I had read about, um, and I knew about people who had come, you know, fallen on hard times and that their houses would suddenly get auctioned or someone would you know, have to go into a nursing home and their place with everything that they owned and all their photographs and everything would go up for auction. And so that's where that started. And I was at a, a writing residency when I was writing it and um, I woke, I was a little afraid and I woke up in the middle of the night and sat up in bed and there was a mirror on the dresser in front of me and I saw my own face. <laughs> And I thought it was a ghost and I was like for briefly just completely terrified and I couldn't go back to sleep. And um, uh, yeah, and so that's that's how I started. That's how the story came about. I ended up writing the whole thing in, in one sitting and um, then working on it for some years after that. Yeah, that's, you know, it's interesting how stories do come to us in pieces, right? I mean, parts, mm -hmm. I mean, it took you, you know, it, it, it wasn't just sitting down and writing the story right away. I mean, it was kind of, you know, experiencing things along the way and using those parts to kind of, you know, to, 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 to animate the story or to continue the story, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, and you were just saying, it's true. I think that I tend to write mostly from my childhood memories. And, um, you know, I think part of that has to do with the fact that I'm still um, I, I left the country where I was born, and um, I also, uh, you know, spent some time in Ukraine when it was under um, the Soviets, and um, I still have memories from there. So I often want to go back in time and revisit those memories, and they often, you know, really kind of have impressed on me, um, you know, in, in ways that I want to write about, so to speak. Um, but, I, you know, I think your stories seem to come from a sort of decidedly kind of grown up space or place, I think, I could be wrong. Um, they seem to turn maybe less so on your memories, but more so on, you know, um, what you've experienced, how you've experienced the world and more fully so now. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that's actually a good assessment of your work. Um, I mean, you, you did mention your father and how some of the memories that you had with him as a child triggered that story. But I don't know. Let's talk a little bit about that. Let's, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's such a good question, I think, too. And, and for me, with these stories, um, I think that's especially true. I don't have there's children that come into my stories, probably in at least two, if not more. And childhood comes in a little bit in a couple of the stories. And I do know that, um, you know, so much of who I am as a writer and what has been emerging, it was always there in childhood as well. It may not come out in, in memory form, in perfect memory. Um, but um, the interest that I had and that, that sort of uncan that interest in the uncanny, what's uncanny or what's unknowable or mysterious, that's been with me forever. Um, and it really shows in your stories, I think. It comes through in almost every story, I think, in that sense. Right? Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I, I, you know, I think writers are probably the worst people to ask um, to understand their own work because I think partly we're writing to try to understand what those things are. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it's interesting to me, I, I've had this uh, conversation a few times now since this book has come out. And I wonder, you know, there are, I, I teach a ghost stories class um, at the Art Institute. And I think it's very um, H Hannah that said that every story is a ghost story. And I'm thinking about this with your work. And 
even though we're count, we're writing about different different experiences, in some ways we have there's certain themes that come up that are similar, um, even though the stories are very different and. Um, and there's an uncanniness in your work as well, this mysteriousness or this um, kind of being missed. Many of your characters are also kind of mystified. I don't know if that's short fiction, if that just opens that, if that's just natural for the short fiction form. But I'm curious to hear your answer on that, maybe just a minute on that. And I and while we're, as long as we're, we're talking about it, maybe this would be a good point for you to, read a little bit from your story. So I, I was um, lucky enough to read early drafts of the story that that one, this is the, if anyone wants to pick it up, it's a Pen America Best Debut Short Story um, collection. And um, Angela's short story, Galena, was um, placed in this, was um, chosen to appear here. And uh, it first appeared in Fifth Wednesday. And so, um, I'd love to have you read a little bit of that and maybe talk for a minute about, about, you know, what, what compels you in your own work. And if that's true, that there's an interest in what's mysterious and uncanny for you too, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I think that um, I'll, I'll read from a section of the book where um, there is this sort of, the, this, the, the character is searching um, and, um, and, Many of my stories, I'm often, I, I often place my characters in these cross-cultural spaces where, um, you know, you have people with different racial backgrounds interacting. Um, in this particular story, um, Galina has left Nigeria and she was at that point married um, to, before she left, she was married to a Nigerian man. Um, and some of this comes from my own background, although it's, it's certainly not based on my mother's story at all. Um, this is purely my imagination, but um, I am biracial and you know, my mother is Ukrainian, my father Nigerian. So I do pull from, from those roots when I write. Um, but this is a story that, you know, in which I was actually writing outside of my race. So it was sort of interesting in a way. And um, I have other stories where I write from a Nigerian man's perspective. Um, I have two stories, I think, where I'm writing from a biracial, you know, or actually more than that, more, more than two stories. But let me read um, this section um, in Galena. It's not very long. Um, and um, this is a section where Galena has, has um, has visited her mother in an ex exclusion zone. So her mother is living in an area that has been deemed uninhabitable because um, there was a nuclear plant accident. So she has left her mother and come back um, to a city where she's, she's living. After the lunch of borscht her mother prepared, Galina returned to Drabov, where she had rented a small, barely furnished one bedroom apartment. As soon as she unlocked the door, she ran the bath, and then she flung off her clothes, shoving them into a plastic bag. Later in the evening, she would do what she always did when she returned from her visits to her mother. She would soak the clothes in hot water overnight and then wash them by hand. She was walking around her apartment in just her underwear when the phone rang. Hello, hello. She immediately knew who the shouting voice was. It was Omaru calling from Nigeria. She pictured his face, always open and inviting, and the way he often furrowed his brow when he spoke, his tall body attractive and lean. And then she fought the impulse to hang up. Yes? Her English sounded foreign to her ears. Galina, Galina, can you hear me? What do you want? How did you find me? I'm calling to say I'm... She gave, up, gave in to the impulse and hung up. By the time she reached the bathroom and opened the door, the phone rang again. Galina stepped into the narrow room and shut the door behind her. She leaned against the door, her back in knots, her arms heavy, and hands and fists. She caught a reflection in the small mirror above the dripping sink, and she felt a whoosh of air leave her thin lips. The face that stared back at her was as pale as the moon, and because her pupils were dilated in her large eyes, she thought again about how she resembled a bird. She unclenched her fists and touched her chin, 
where sunspots had emerged, reminding her of those sunny days in Nigeria when she changed into her bikini, thrown a towel on the grass outside their house, and taken in the hot rays of the equatorial sun. One such day, she had felt a nudge on her right shoulder and found a Nigerian neighbor standing over her. Madame, Madame, are you okay? He had said. She removed her sunglasses and laughed out loud. Yes, of course, I'm just sunbathing. He had nodded and walked away quickly as if embarrassed. In the bathroom, Galena laughed to herself, a contrived laugh at once girlish and manic. If she was losing her mind, this might be one of the symptoms. But she was unlikely to do the research required to know what happens to a person when her internal world suddenly su suffers a sudden obliteration or collapse. No, there was no need for any research. She was here to begin anew. The phone rang again. Galina undressed fully and slipped into the bath, sinking into its, sinking into its warmth deeper and deeper until more than half her head was submerged and she couldn't hear the ringing of the phone until all was silent like in a dream. Thank you. And that's it. That's so wonderful. I love that story. And I, one of the things that I love that you do in that story and, and in several of your other ones is there's, there's often this sort of sense of um, discomfort that comes from the physical sensations of the character um, and then the descriptions of the world around that character. And I, I love how that happens. Do you want to say maybe just to you know, segue back into our conversation, what was the initial trigger, if you remember, for that story? Do you remember what you initially um, brought you into Galena? Well, you, you know, it's, it's, I was thinking about that the other day, and, and I, I think I said this in a few interviews that I've had, is that, you know, I'd been um, just thinking about the stories of, of um, Ukrainian and Russian women who lived um, in Nigeria and the, the uniqueness of their stories. Um, and then I, I watched a doc, or I, I saw uh, a documentary. I didn't watch it, but I saw that it was actually being made. It was called Babushkas of Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. And um, it was about these old, um, you know, women who had decided they were not going to leave um, areas that had been affected by, by you know, the Chernobyl blast. Um, and they had stayed um, because these were their homes and they were not willing to leave. So I had this idea of then, you know, a woman with a troubled marriage leaving that marriage, leaving Nigeria, and then returning to this rather strange zone um, and processing, you know, processing her own pain and, and past. So. Yeah, and, and, and I, I think that as I write more and more, I think that many of my stories do have this thing about bodies moving through these fictive worlds and, you know, trying to kind of make sense of that, especially if you're, you know, in, in some of my stories, um, these characters are biracial. Um, and so they have a more complicated, sometimes a more complicated relationship of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and not always just biracial, but um, living some, you know, having experiences in three different continents, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. We've talked about that, you know, Nigeria and then Ukraine and then now America, which is, you know, looms large now in my imagination. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and so your stories too. I mean, I think we talked about this earlier, you know, how art often, um, comes into play in your stories. And, um, you know, I think you have a couple of stories where um, the characters really, um, you know, the, the characters are drawn from actual art pieces, um, or they might be inspired by theater or theatrical art or something like that. So I'm wondering, you know, for people who might read your work and think about how you made that happen, from an actual piece of art. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that process. Yeah, so when I was in grad school, I 
I was reading quite a bit of ekphrastic poetry and I was thinking about this, but also I think, you know, I had this idea that I wanted to write a collection of stories that was, each story was inspired in some way by art, um, but I didn't want to do it in the way that I had seen so many poetry, um, you know, so many poets do it. And I was, you know, really thinking about what, how art can inform fiction in a way that the fiction takes off and becomes its own thing. Um, and so, uh, and then um, I think also, I, I was finding myself inspired by these things and I wanted to find a way to make it to, to use what, what was out there. And, um, and so I, I grew up watching a lot of old films and, um, you know, quit ha having like lines from movies that still kind of run in my head. And I wanted, I really wanted to write a story where I could just have, you know, cheesy lines from old movies, you know, run through the, the story. And so I was like, how can I do that without it and have it still be a story and not just a vehicle for doing that. And so, um, but, but a lot of the story started from the, the initial stories were from paintings because I love paintings. And um, that when I was younger, that's what I thought I would become. One of the things that I thought I would become was a painter. Um, and, um, and so I wanted to take these scenes from paintings and turn them into stories. And uh, the first story in the collection is, um, you know, based on uh, Louise uh, uh, Bourgeois' work. And, um, and that was, and then the rest um, all started going in different directions. And this is what I, this is what I ended up with. Well, it's interesting because that story, the Felina, which is the first one, um, it's, um, you have a character who's so into this this this, uh, this sort of theat theatrical thing, and it almost takes over the story in a way that almost overwhelms the protagonist, right? And mm -hmm. and really kind of rocks his world. And uh, um, yeah, and, and and so I, I you know I, I I love those stories where they you know something just kind of um, takes over, especially when you're writing, and it it um, you know pushes the story in one direction or the other. Yeah, and I think sometimes too, Angela, I don't know if you've had this experience, but having a constraint will often lead to other things. And in the end, I had to get rid of the idea that every piece was going to be based on a work of art because it, you know, the book wanted to go where it wanted to go. But what I found that was happening was that, and it keeps, and this, this question keeps following me into a new work as well. And it's, you know, um, what's the difference between, you know, art that we see in a gallery and the things that we make at home? You know, where's the line between useful art and beautiful art? Um, you know, all the questions that, that kind of are inherent, but especially when it comes to commerce and art, for some reason, I keep going back to that. And it comes in, you know, sideways into a lot of my work, you know, the, this, uh, you know, the economy of art and the economy of making and what happens um, when we put prices on things or when we move something from a gallery into a rundown old apartment um, that someone's living in, you know, so it's not, not even some sort of installation that people can come and visit, but do people still see it as art? Or if you take something that looks homemade from someone's house and stick it on a pedestal in an art museum, um, does that, is that, suddenly does it does it suddenly incur value and so those questions have led to other things and um and yeah and so here i am i'm still you know still finding that it's coming into other other things that i'm writing about well i think it's just it's really exciting because we often think of art as separate from writing in a way you know and you've managed to kind of maybe not meld the two, but have them in conversation with each other, you know, in a story. And I think that's just, you know, that's, that's wonderful. It's actually kind of magical in a way as you're reading a story. Um, Thank you. I, you know, it's something that I think a lot of writers do too. And I'm, I, um, I, I don't know about you, but I balk at stories about writers. I'm just like, oh, I don't want to write. I don't want to read about a writer. And sometimes I do that even with, you know, the often, writers will bring in a photographer and it's it's sort of a, a loosely veiled version of themselves you know or the the things that we're dealing with and so i didn't want to do that 
Um, and because I didn't want to do that, what I found was I was thinking about other types of making um, and building and, you know, things like that. So, um, but, but I do think there's a danger in, in also, you know, writing about um, artists as an artist. And you know, sometimes it's hard to get that kind of distance and, um, you know, to actually open the, open the stories up. Yeah, I, I remember one of the, my, my stories, I think I had the protagonist be a writer and it just, it, it, it was not working, you know, I, mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, and also a struggling writer, you know, a writer that's trying to kind of make it, you know, and uh, it's just, it, it's, yeah, it's sort of a, a, a double thing that's going on, a kind of helix that just <laughs> I don't know, yeah, doesn't yeah. always work. It can work. The thing is, like, as soon as we start talking, saying this, of course, we'll both think of all kinds of exceptions to that rule. I mean, I think about the, like the film adaptation or like um, Philip Roth's a mystery writer. I mean, I could probably go on and on. Um, but, but yeah, I agree. Like, it's it's hard also to do something that hasn't been done. Not that 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 doesn't haunt us in every single thing that we write. <laughs> but yeah, 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 that's true. Well, talking about haunt haunting, um, I had another question for you, um, you know, because I think that um, in your stories, there's always something brewing, a little dark that's brewing beneath the surface. And, and I do think the effect is ultimately quite haunting for the reader. Um, and I imagine that's de deliberate on your part as a writer, right? Um, um, and, but since a few of your stories happen in the Midwest, um, I, you know, when I was reading, I wondered if your stories were trying to tell us something <laughs> about um, this part of the world, if, if they were trying to maybe speak to something hidden or not so hidden, that, you know, that's a truth at the core of, of, of the society or the, the area or the country at large, maybe. Maybe this is too too loaded of a question in this. No, I think it's a really, um, era, a really fair question, Angela. And I mean, given what's going on in the country, you know, given I mean, I the hard part is knowing, you know, how do you draw lines? I mean, you get a bunch of Midwesterners in a room and ask them where the Midwest begins and ends, and they'll you'll have an argument that will last for hours. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then there's so many different kinds of the Midwest. And so, you know. I think it's a really great question and it's one that's worth asking and that people are asking. And, um, and I love that our idea of the Midwest keeps breaking down too. you know, like there used to be, I think these sort of cliche um, visions of the Midwest and, and they probably still exist, but there's so many different versions of the Midwest that also don't get seen. And that does, I think, haunt, Midwestern literature and like the things that we don't write about, the things that I, as a, you know, a Midwesterner who comes from rural, small town, Wisconsin, um, you know, fairly white, uh, small town, there's things that don't come into my work that also haunt my stories, you know? And so, um, you know, and when I'm writing about the city, I think there's always, for me, there's little tells that I'm not that even though I've lived in cities most of my le my adult life, there's still this sort of rural mentality that I can't shake. I mean, I think you you kind of talked about that side long with your work too, like these um, sort of competing different ways of looking at yourself and like your um, you know, your makeup. You know, the Nigerian side, the Ukrainian side, the U.S. side. Um, you know, those <laughs> trying to figure that out. I don't. Um, it's. I think that when you're asking those kinds of questions and when you bring place into it, that you, that in, it's very easy to have things become haunted feeling. But then there's also something extra for me that has nothing, I don't think it has a whole lot to do with the Midwest or with, you know, even my, like my background or it's, it's something else that, yeah. uh, I think you and I have talked about this before with childhood because you, you were also really an imaginative child. And I think we even had a conversation about dolls once, <laughs> that about how uncanny they are. Yeah, and, yeah. And so, I mean, maybe some of us, maybe writers are just naturally inclined to be haunted. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> well, I think we have an 
our obsessions and I think some of them are just darker than others, right? Yeah. And you, and actually I think we had an email exchange about this um, and one of us, I think maybe it was you, said something about how, you know, like dr you're drawn to this. So you're drawn to darker things. And, and that part of that's because you think deeply about things. Mm -hmm. And when you think about things deeply, it's, it's hard to stay on the surface and to not um, think about um, the darker side of things as well as the brighter, the brighter side. If, if um, you know, you can even delineate, sometimes it's hard to delineate from the two. <laughs> Well, also, I think that with fiction, right, I mean, most often the happier stories aren't always the best stories, right? I mean, people want some amount of, um, whether it's conflict or, you know, uh, element of the dark in there, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Although someday, and I don't know, I think we maybe we've talked about this before, too, that I would love to write. I do think that you can get stuck in this fiction is conflict and, um, you know, one of the questions that I have running in the back of my mind a lot when I write these days is how can I do this differently so I'm not always taking the same, a similar sort of trajectory? And, um, you know, how can I bring more brightness or change sort of the makeup of a story so, so that the, the things that I'm throwing into the mix are not, you know, they're not similar tonalities to something I've done before. Mm -hmm. But it's... Uh, it's an ongoing, it's, it's a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, shifting gears a little bit in, in, mm -hmm. in writing stories, yeah. But you're working on a novel now, right? So mm -hmm. are you still writing short stories or are those kind of, um, you're not able to write them because you're writing these longer narratives, right? Or a longer narrative. Well, I've, I've taken some breaks to re to write some smaller things. And I do have, I finished a short story that takes place here in um, Chicago uh, recently. And I think I wrote maybe just a couple others. I have all kinds of drafts, but I do find it's really hard to, I've been in deep, intensely in this novel now for going on seven years. And so it's really hard for me to take a break and um, work on something new, although I'm getting to that point now, so. That's great. So I don't know. I mean, are we close to questions? Because I see I'm looking at the time. And oh, yeah, we've got about 10 minutes left. I can't see any questions here. Hi, so. Ron. Hi, Annie. Hi. Um, yeah. So we are happy to take questions now. So anyone who's watching, please write your questions in the chat. I will start you off. I have a question. Um, a very typical bookseller question. But since this is a discussion about short fiction, I am going to ask the name dropping question. Can you please tell us a couple, each of you, a couple of your short fiction influences or favorites? Because those could be two different things. Well, I can I can start because I happen to have two brand new ones on my desk right now that I'm excited oh. about. And one of them is, this is in galley still, but the, I think it's a hard cover, a beautiful cover. It's Life Among the Terranauts by mm -hmm. Caitlin Horrocks. It's really fantastic. It's so imaginative. Um, it even starts with a, with a, a, a short story about a, a whole town that goes into hibernation, which was written during a Mich Michigan winter and <laughs> ends with this wonderful, um, you know, uh, story life among the terranauts where you've got scientists living inside of a bubble which is like the most perfect story for reading during a pandemic yeah um and then there's um put uh patty ann mcnair's um uh, responsible adults that just came out with a small the small press cornerstone press mm -hmm. uh, and um it's really wonderful too lots of um uh you know uh sh kind of gritty short stories uh really wonderful great well, thank you so much. Angela, do you have some some favorites to mention or some influences of your work? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the Russian writers are just such masters, you know, Tolstoy, um, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, but Zamyatin, who's, uh, who wrote mm -hmm. a book called We, um, I, and also has short stories that are just amazing. Um, and, um, and it, you know, I. Also, I mean, there recently have been a lot of uh, really great African women writers who are 
mm -hmm. coming out with novels. Um, I'm thinking of um, the Mwali Sir Serpel, mm -hmm. um, The Old Drift. Again, I hope I'm not saying her name wrongly. Um, even yeah, Gyasi's uh, Transcendent Kingdom. I mean, these are novels I know, but um, you know, these are women who are really, um, you know, writing some very interesting stuff, um, bending yeah. genres and um, well, not yeah, Gyasi, but uh, um, so yeah. I mean, those are the the few that come to mind. You know, I, I could probably go on and on, but yeah, <laughs> I'll stop right there. Uh, out of curiosity, since you mentioned African women writers, have you ever read Jennifer Nansubuga Makumbi? Actually, you I've heard of her work, but I have not read it. So this is her short story collection. It takes place mostly among the Ugandan community in Manchester, apparently in England. Apparently there's a large um, immigrant community there. But then her other, her two novels take place in Uganda and they're more historical. They, they're they more like long standing epic, but her short fiction is really, um, takes place across all time periods and it's awesome. So anyway. That's great. <laughs> just throwing that out there, some bookseller. Yeah, I'll have to pick up her work. <laughs> Um, yeah, so let's see. I don't see any questions. So let me just remind everyone that one of you is going to receive in the mail a copy of How to Walk on Water, courtesy of Rachel. So that's very exciting. And you will receive an email if you are the randomly chosen winner. And the Majors and Quinn website is www.majorsandquinn.com. That's all spelled out. Um, you can also get there from our YouTube profile. And uh, both How to Walk on Water and uh, the book in which Angela's award-winning short story is in the collection is, is available. It is the 2017 Penn America Best Debut Short Stories collection. And that is also linked on the event information on our website. So I want to say thank you for tuning in and being with us on this Thursday evening, our first author event of 2021. And thank you both for that wonderful discussion. I, it's my favorite type of event where we have two authors talking to each other because um, I just think it's such a great window into the side of uh, books and especially fiction that I don't get to see, uh, and you know, I get to see the finished product and I love hearing uh, about how it got there. So thank you both so much. Thank you everyone for watching and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Majors and Quinn.